In October of 1959, three Avro Vulcan nuclear bombers were performing at the opening of the new Wellington International Airport in New Zealand. It was an exciting time for airshows, especially with all the new futuristic jet aircraft on display. However, all these aircraft throwing themselves around the sky may be exciting, but disaster is never very far away. Accidents are rare, but at this airshow, disaster was narrowly averted not once, but three times in one day. Located on the southern tip of New Zealand's North Island is Wellington International Airport. Formerly known as Rongatai Airport, it had been in use since 1929, but it had become unsuitable for newer, larger aircraft and had to be closed by 1949. But by the early 1950s, it was decided that the city of Wellington should once again have an airport within its own suburbs, and so plans were drawn up to convert the old Rongatai airstrip into a new, modern international airport. This was no easy job, and involved the reclamation of a huge amount of land in order to extend the runway. Some 160 houses had to be relocated, as land was pushed into Evans Bay and Lyle Bay. By 1958, with the airport nearing completion, new airport dispersals and aprons, as well as a new air traffic control tower were installed. And by the middle of 1959, Wellington Airport was ready. A grand opening was now needed to launch this modern new airport into service. And it was decided that the Labour weekend of Saturday 24th and Sunday 25th of October was an ideal time for a grand air show to announce its arrival. On show that weekend was the very latest in civilian and military aircraft. The immediate post-war years had seen dramatic advancements in technology and the crowd were entertained by displays from the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia and of course New Zealand. But the star of the show, and the most eagerly anticipated, was the brand new Avro Vulcan bomber. For the airshow weekend, four Avro Vulcan B-1 aircraft from RAF 617 Squadron were based at Royal New Zealand Air Force Base Ohakia. The Avro Vulcan B-1 had entered service with the RAF in July of 1956 as a high-altitude, nuclear-capable strategic bomber. One of three designs ordered by the UK government that made up the V-Force, the United Kingdom's strategic nuclear strike force, alongside the Vickers Valiant and the Handley Page Victor. Of the three V-bombers, the Vulcan was considered to be the most technically advanced. But putting aside its obvious military capability, it was also a hugely exciting airshow attraction. Its dramatic delta wing, deafening howling roar and fighter-like performance was guaranteed to amaze any crowd and steal any show. And 617 Squadron brought three along for the show. With everything in place for the grand opening, the only thing that was missing was the weather. Cloud, wind and rain had unfortunately meant that there would be no flying on the Saturday, with the disappointed crowds only able to wander the windswept static displays and the indoor exhibits. But the following day, a slight reprieve. The rain had stopped and the clouds dispersed, although it remained a blustery day. The flying could commence, although it would turn out to be a challenging day for the display pilots. The challenging windy conditions were confirmed when a formation of de Havilland Devon and North American Harvard trainer aircraft flew over. The aircrews later stated that they had to use all their controls to prevent bumping into the aircraft alongside. Nevertheless, the show continued, with displays from the English Electric Canberra of the Royal Australian Air Force. Remarkable show takeoff and landings from the Fokker Friendship and the Handley Page Dart Herald. The United States showed some skills despite the winds by an in-flight refueling formation flypast of the Boeing KB-29 Super Fortress. McDonnell F-101 Voodoo and North American F-86 Sabre, before the fighters split off and carried out solo displays. Also displaying amazing short takeoff and landing capability was a C-130 Hercules of the United States Air Force, even showing off its ability to reverse on the apron.
RAF Transport Command were present also with the Bristol Britannia, Blackburn Beverly and the de Havilland Comet 2 of 216 Squadron, the first ever jet-powered transport squadron. The first incident of the day followed the arrival of a short Sunderland flying boat of the Royal New Zealand Air Force, which had flown in from Hobsonville Air Base near Auckland. The short Sunderland was a British-built flying boat patrol bomber, designed for the RAF, and it was introduced into service in 1938, and then went on to also see service with the French Navy, the Royal Australian Air Force, South African Air Force, the Royal Canadian Air Force, Norwegian Air Force and the Portuguese Navy, and of course the Royal New Zealand Air Force. The intention was to carry out a smooth, low-level pass along the length of the runway, to give the crowds a very close view of the size and grace of the Sunderland. However, the turbulent weather was proven to be quite a handful. The flight deck has the pilots positioned approximately 20 feet above the keel, and on this occasion, it came in just too low. The aircraft keel struck the runway and tore a hole in the bottom of the aircraft and left a marked streak on the runway. The wounded flying boat climbed away and returned to Hobsonville. Somewhat cheekily, co-pilot Robin Klitscher wrote in his logbook, Touch and go, Rongatai. Not often seen for a wheelless aircraft. The show continued and before long the star turn had arrived. Streaking overhead came three Avro Vulcan B-1 bombers of 617 Squadron. In a close formation, they performed a couple of circuits before one of them, XH-498, split off for a solo display. The intention was to carry out a couple of touch and goes before a full stop landing. If the continuing windy conditions wasn't enough of a challenge, the pilot of the Vulcan would need to use the absolute maximum length of the runway to carry out a landing and stop safely. The touch and goes would allow him to calibrate his sights for a pinpoint threshold landing. At the end of the taxiway, feeding the runway threshold, sat four de Havilland vampires of the Royal New Zealand Air Force aerobatic team. They were waiting for their turn to take off, to close the show immediately following the Vulcan's landing. They had a prime view for what happened next. The first approach of the Vulcan saw the main wheels cross the end of the runway and touch down some 10 feet into the runway. The second was even closer, only just passing the start of the tarmac. Feeling confident, the pilot of the Vulcan came around for his third approach and full stop landing. This time, the vampire crews watched on in horror as the Vulcan touched down short of the runway. The port side undercarriage struck a walled embankment and collapsed. The wingtip came perilously close to striking the ground, which, if it had, would have dug into the grass, causing the Vulcan to spin off the runway and into the direction of the assembled crowds. Fortunately, this disaster was avoided as the Vulcan immediately selected full power and was hauled back into the air. The danger was far from over, however, as the collapsed main leg was flailing rearwards, having had its attachment point in the wing damaged, and it struck the underside of the wing, rupturing a fuel tank. With the aviation fuel gushing out of the wing and the crippled bomber climbing skyward, it set a direct course back to Ohakia Air Base. The navigator on board was startled to see his fuel quantity instruments falling rapidly and he ordered his captain to get the bomber on the ground, fast. At Ohakia Air Base, the 617 Squadron commander ordered the three men in the rear of the Vulcan to put on their parachutes and bail out. In the Vulcan, only the pilot and co-pilot had ejection seats, the three other crew members having the unenviable task of dropping out through the entrance hatch in the belly of the aircraft. On this occasion, the three men, faced with the possibility of striking the hanging, flailing undercarriage leg as they left the aircraft, decided to decline the order to bail out and take their chances in remaining with the crippled Vulcan. The captain agreed and set his approach for an emergency landing at Ohakia. This time the touchdown could not have been smoother, the captain holding the aircraft level on the good leg until there was insufficient airspeed, at which point the port side collapsed into the ground and the aircraft span off into the grass and came to rest. All five aircrew heaved a huge sigh of relief. They had survived. 
Meanwhile, with disaster averted for a second time that afternoon, the four de Havilland vampires of the Royal New Zealand Air Force aerobatic team were given clearance for takeoff. Aerobatic display teams have always been a huge attraction at airshows, but with the recent advent of jet fighters, these displays were taken to new heights. The vampires put on a fantastic display with dramatic twists and turns, but it was at the climax to the routine that disaster would almost strike. The final routine, the downward bomb burst, involved four aircraft climbing vertically in tight formation before pulling over into a steep vertical dive. The aircraft would then pull out, facing the four points of the compass. Quite a dramatic end to the display. Unfortunately, as the aircraft were pulling over into their dive, out of nowhere came a thick cloud, which they found themselves in the thick of. It was essential to have visual contact with each other before breaking, so as not to collide. And it was a panicked group leader who called break once they had cleared the cloud. They were, however, much closer to the ground by now than they would have liked. Hauling back on the controls, one of the pilots later claimed to have pulled as much as 12G in trying to avoid hitting the ground. A member of the public, who was very close to the incident, also later claimed that one of the aircraft was no more than three metres from the ground when it began to climb out of the dive. Disaster averted, again, for a third time. Back at Ohakia, the crew of the Vulcan were to have no rest. Having had their lucky escape and stare disaster in the face, they were ordered back into the air in a spare aircraft the following day to fly an exhibition flight over Ohakia. On this overseas trip for 617 Squadron, the Vulcan wasn't finished yet. Thanks very much for watching. Please hit the like button and consider subscribing. Mike Bravo to Scampton, climbing on heading. Captain to AO, climbing checks. Oxygen, Captain. Co pilot, Bravo, radar, AO, content 78.